Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 34, page 860. Uh, as I was listening uh, to Andrew's introduction to the service, I was reminded there are so many passages you could pick for this sermon, aren't there? And uh, you could pick all sorts of passages. So I've picked one from Jesus' first sermon in Matthew's biography of Jesus, because we're working our way through Matthew. Uh, but there's sections from Proverbs, there's sections from Luke, uh, sections even from Genesis, which we'll turn to next term as we see how Jacob handles wealth. But we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 34, page 860. Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can be a slave of two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and of money. This is why I tell you, don't worry about your life what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add a single cubit to his height by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Learn how the wild flowers of the field grow. They don't labour or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendour was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the idolaters eagerly seek all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, no worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Well, there's a sermon outline there inside your newsletters, uh, household questions or a way to talk about it afterwards. Uh, if you've got a chance to do that this afternoon, let me encourage you to do that. Uh, learn the memory verse, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Uh, like I said last week, we've only got two weeks for that. And so that memory verse challenge is next weekend. And uh, I'll buy the Mars bar sometimes this week. And hopefully, like last week, I'll have none left, uh, which was a terrific encouragement as people put the word of God into their hearts and minds. Uh, let me begin with a question. How single-minded is God when it comes to his commitment to what he's made? How single-minded is God when it comes to his commitment to this world, to those who bear his image? Well, God is single-minded in loving his enemies, people like us. God's single-minded in committing all of himself, every part of his being, to deal with his enemies. God is single-minded in taking on flesh to live, die, and rise for his enemies. God is single-minded in his mercy. His mercy is undivided. His mercy is committed. His mercy is wholehearted. His mercy is completely focused on his enemies. Uh, That single-minded mercy of God reveals his very nature. And for our benefit, it saves us too, doesn't it? And saving people like us, that mercy doesn't work as an insurance policy. That mercy doesn't work as a set of wise advice you flip to in times of trouble. That mercy doesn't even work as some form of cosmic therapy or, as Ben reminded us last week, having a really big life coach. 
That mercy completely transforms the enemies of God. If you remember back to the series we had on Colossians, remember that terrific picture that Neil Hunt drew that showed that we change our postcodes from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. In the book of Ephesians, which we looked at in 2020, it resurrects the walking dead, making them alive. In Matthew, we've been reminded that it grabs the outsider and brings them in. It takes the restless and binds them up. And as we've seen in Genesis over a number of years, it takes a bloke who bows down to a block of wood and transforms him into the father of the people of God. That's the single-minded mercy that we heard about in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. This is your spiritual, logical worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. The single-minded mercy of God, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ claims all of those who receive it. Did you notice that in those two verses? It takes their bodies as they give back to God the thing that bears his image. It claims their minds as they change from being I am God to God is God. And it claims their whole will, transforming it from me and me time to being focused on the desire and will and design of God. It takes sinners and makes them righteous, doesn't it? It takes sinners and returns them to the straight and single design that God made for them. That's at the heart of this small series we're looking at at the moment. Now, it's been scattered all over the term. Five weeks ago, we looked at Christ and crown, didn't we, looking at politics. We talked about three building blocks. The first building block, that there is a king, his name's Jesus, Psalm 2, that he's concerned about image bearers, Matthew 22, that this is a message that has to be taken to the world, Acts chapter 4. Uh, Now we're going to look at Christ and cash. And next week we'll look at Christ and conscience, how to make ethical decisions in life. Uh, We're moving in this sermon from Christ and crown where we deal with the structures that God has made to the very heart of who we are. Did you pick that up in the reading we had from Matthew chapter 6? We're dealing with our eyes and our hearts and our boss and our daily necessities. So how about I pray? And then we're going to dive into it together. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that it reveals how single-minded you are, how committed you are, how wholehearted you are in your mercy for your enemies. Father, that is just such a delight to a bloke like me who is by nature your enemy, to people like us. Our Father, thank you that your wholeheartedness claims all of us. As we think about what that looks like today, as we come to our money, our possessions, our assets, please bring us as your people to a wholehearted righteousness that depends upon you as our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm at Matthew Matthew 6.2 on the outline. I'll wake up in a second. Uh, Jesus' first training session with his disciples, Sermon on the Mount. Remember, we we looked at that in 2019. Uh, It's a remarkable sermon. Uh, Most people know it because of the Beatitudes. But at the heart of it, it's actually the first citizenship induction session, Uh, a way of helping these 12 and their hangers-on to think about what it means to be part of God's people, to be in God's mob. Uh, At its heart is righteousness. Righteousness is a really simple term. It comes from a word that talks about being straight, in line with, right with God's design. Put simply, the men and women who are listening to what Jesus says can't be righteous on their own, can they? That's the whole part of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus just deconstructs them and brings them to realise that if they're ever going to be in line with God, they've got to be connected to Jesus because Jesus is right with God. Jesus does live as God designed. And if you are connected to him, if you trust that he is that, God says, you're one of my mob. 
And once you're connected to Jesus, you live in line with the kingdom standard, which is righteousness. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus focuses on the behaviour of the kingdom. Uh, You see there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, he talks about acts of righteousness. These are the things that define you as already being in the kingdom. They don't get you in. They say you already are in because you're connected to Jesus. And I want you to notice something really particular about Matthew chapter 6. It talks a lot about our Father. He's not really mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, the Father word. He's not really mentioned much in Matthew chapter 7, but suddenly in Matthew chapter 6, there's Father language all over the place. And so really to be a citizen in Jesus' kingdom is to call God Father, to be part of his family. And so righteousness expresses the family resemblance. It expresses the family resemblance. And Jesus is a really particular image in verse 22 to help us understand that. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? Uh, Your translations would have had the word healthy there instead of good. Uh, We understand that image, don't we? I mean, we're we're a bit more scientifically advanced, but we know how this works. Uh, When you look at something, it goes into you, don't you? Uh, When you look at something on a screen, when you read something, when you see a picture... That goes into your body, into your soul. But I think we can only understand the depth of what Jesus is saying when we realise that the word we have translated as good or healthy is just as well translated as single or straight or sincere. Jesus is saying you need a single eye. Uh, we love Agquip. We haven't been to Agquip for a while. Uh, Agquip's a big day, isn't it, when you go to Agquip? Uh, I don't go three days. I know that some people do. Uh, when you go to Agquip, there are two types of people. When you go this year, have a look around. Uh, the first person is the person who goes to Agquip to have a look around. They're there out of curiosity. Uh, they're there just to have a gander at anything and everything. Uh, they walk the full 20 kilometres guided by their nose, their ears and their eyes. <laughs> Oh, short horns, let's go and have a bite of them. Oh, that popcorn over there. Oh, that soap. Oh, gee, look at those machines. They just wander around. They don't have a single eye at Agquip, do they? Then you've got the other type of people. They go to Agquip with a single eye. They want a tractor. They want a silo. They want a new spray rig. They've got one focus and it defines everything they do at Agquip, doesn't it? They don't care about the shorthorns. They don't care about the toffee. They don't care about the apples. They're there with one eye. And so they make all the decisions on that day with that one single focus. It's the same with people who call God their father. There are those who are distracted. They just meander along. Look at this. Smell that. Hear this. They have a distracted eye, a divided eye. Then there are those who have a single eye. That's my father. And I look at him and I'm not distracted. I have one focus and that's my father. We know the truth of that statement, don't we? (laughs) If you have a single eye, you're not distracted, are you? The light is intense and it's focused. But if our focus is distracted then there's no light, is there? It's just a babble of greyness and a fog and refraction and distraction. And Jesus' closing words in these two verses really strike home at the consequence, if the eye of you is dark, how great is that darkness? It's not inconsequential, is it? Because whether or not your eye is single or not, defines the light or darkness of your soul. Puts it in a bigger ballpark, doesn't it? If the eye is dark, it's not just physical. It's soul-based. If the eye is dark in the present, the eye will be dark eternally. 
If it is dark now, it will be dark in the future. It shows that all-encompassing nature of righteousness, doesn't it? The family resemblance to be in God's kingdom is to call God Father, to experience the mercy of God by trusting in Jesus. It's to be singular in your eyes, to be focused on one all-encompassing truth. God is Father, Jesus is King, and God's mercy has got all of me. And then that idea of single runs throughout the rest of this passage. At the heart of the battle, where I'm at point three on the outline, at the heart of the battle of being righteous uh, is the fact that we have competitors, don't we? Uh, Not competitors with us, but competitors for our attention. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Whose approval do you seek? Such approval-seeking can distract our single eye and will redirect our single heart. My heart yearns for approval, for acceptance. My heart yearns for the things that give me comfort and me time and help me fit in. My heart is distracted by the things in this world that make me feel confident and place me in the right spot in my town. My heart seeks the control that comes from possessions and material comfort and an established retirement. And such a heart leads me to focus on what? Look at verse 19. Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves don't bring, break in and steal. For where your treasure is, There your heart is also. Two commands, and they both focus on what? How singular is your heart? Where is it directed? What does it desire? What does it focus on? Do you notice that there is a long-term consequence of each heart focus? Steve brought out really well in the kids' talk. Uh, On the one hand, a heart focused on treasuring treasure here will be a heart, well, it'll be a heart broken, won't it? A heart disappointed. Because as soon as you buy that car, it's depreciated. As soon as you own that house, you need insurance because it will disappear. No one is buried in and with their possessions. On the other hand, A heart focused on treasure that is connected with God's kingdom will be a heart focused on things that last. And the key question there is, what is the treasure that lasts? What is the treasure connected with God's kingdom? And that was that second building block I mentioned at the start. What's the king concerned about? He's concerned about image bearers, isn't he? What's the focus of the kingdom of God? It's people. Those who bear the image of God for whom Jesus died, the people that God desperately, wholeheartedly, single-mindedly commits to restoring. That's the treasure. That's of the kingdom. A single eye, a single heart is the result of having a single master. I'm at point four. Look at verse 24. No one can be a slave of two masters since either he will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and money. Uh, I'm so thankful for how good Jesus is with illustrations because I don't have to come up with any. We know how good that illustration is, don't we? Because you can't have two bosses at the same time, can you? We might like to think we can, (laughs) but you can't. If Jesus is your king and if God is your father... They're in charge of all of you. If money is your boss, you're the boss. And money is. And you notice the sharp language Jesus uses there? It's not a matter of even being lukewarm with God. <laughs> if your money is your master, you despise God. You love yourself. You despise God. Now, that's a pretty brutal opening section, isn't it? A single eye, a single heart, a single boss. Jesus uses very blunt terms 
to expose. But it actually gets to the guts of what it means to be part of this kingdom, what it means to call God Father and Jesus King, what it means to do with cash and money and assets as God desires. It's an issue of being single-eyed, single-hearted and having one boss. If we are members of God's kingdom, if Jesus is our king and we call God our Father, and let me tell you, we will do that later on in the service, won't we? Our Father who is. If we do that, we have one focus, and that encompasses every part of our existence. Our focus is the same as our kings. Our focus is the same as our Father. It's on image bearers and them being restored to rightness. So before I go on to the last section, let me just ask you three very simple questions. Where is your eye focused? What does your heart treasure? Who is your boss? The answers are very easy to come by. Uh, You'll come by your answer by looking at your spending by working out your holiday decisions, by understanding your mortgages and your borrowing, by examining your cupboards and your possessions, by looking at your work habits and your property decisions. And you'll come to an answer very quickly. It does raise a reasonable question, though, and Jesus isn't unreasonable, If we live as God's citizens, God's people, as citizens of Jesus' kingdom here, if we call God our Father, we've still got to make daily decisions, don't we? And God is very clear. There's a whole book in the Bible called Proverbs saying, be wise about that. So what about my daily necessities? What I'll eat? What I'll wear? Do you notice that Jesus already knows you're going to ask that question? Look at verse 25. This is why I say to you, (laughs) Jesus already knows that that will be our natural question. And look at what he goes on to say. This is why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than that? Uh, Do you see the logic there? The the key bit is that phrase in verse 27, your heavenly father. If God is your father, if Jesus is your king, if you have a single heart, a single eye and a single boss, if you're connected to Jesus and living in line with the kingdom focus, don't stress about the necessities. Don't stress about the necessities. Why? Do you notice the father language? (laughs) Did you pick that up there in verse 26? It's really important. If the first section is confronting, this section is comforting. You've got a father. He knows what you need. You've got a father. He knows your necessities. Your father knows what you need, and he has committed in public to provide it. In case you doubt it, look around you. And that's exactly what Jesus does in verse 26. Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather in a barn. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than them? And then look down in verse 28. Learn how the wild fowls of the field grow. They don't labour or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was adorned like one of these. Uh, very clear, If uh, to put it in simple terms, if God the Creator looks after the pets... He's going to make sure the kids are okay. If your heavenly father makes sure the flowers look terrific and the sparrows are fed, what's he going to do for his own children? Well, he's going to make sure they have what they need. Worrying and being anxious about it, doubting whether God is up to the job, is going to add nothing. And I want you to notice here that Jesus isn't dealing with luxuries, is he? He's dealing with necessities. He's dealing with real world concerns. 
not first world fringe benefits. And he sums it up succinctly in verse 31. So don't worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. For the idolaters eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Do you you notice how Jesus describes the people who worry about these things, who seek after them? Did you notice the phrase? Idolaters. People who give to inanimate objects the devotion that God deserves. He goes up a little further at the end of verse 30. He's even blunter. He describes people who worry about these things as you of little faith. Don't you trust that your father knows what you need? In Jesus' words, there is one single focus for God's more. What is it? His kingdom. <laughs> Living in line with that. Being concerned for people that they too are restored. Be focused on that and know that God promises you'll have what you need to be his mob. He knows what you need. To seek God's kingdom is to live as one of his children, to be so concerned for other image bearers of God that we do everything within all our means to introduce them to Jesus. It's to live with a single-eyed focus on our Father and Jesus as King. It's to live with a singular heart, which is not divided, which is devoted. It's to have one boss. It's a very simple list of priorities, isn't it? There's only one entry. So what? Because really... I I know how you work because I work like this. When I see a topic like this uh, on the sermon series, I want to know what to do on Monday morning. It's great to get the theology. (laughs) But I want to know how to put it into practice. You might be disappointed with what I'm about to say, okay? But I want you to think about it. Uh, What does this mean for us? Uh, Let me close with three simple things. First, to be the object of God's wholehearted mercy to call God Father and Jesus as Lord, to say that you are in the kingdom because you are connected to Jesus is to have every inch of your life claimed by God. That's how we are to view Monday morning. It's to have every part of our existence devoted to one standard, not goodness, but reflecting God as our Father, seeking his concern and his rule. Second, to be a member of God's mob and to be part of Jesus' kingdom is to pursue that kingdom in each facet of your life. It's to pursue that kingdom single-mindedly in every inch of existence, It's to look at your employment through the lens of the kingdom. It's to think about your leisure and luxury spending, your necessity needs, your disposable income, your property purchases, your mortgage decisions, your borrowing, your lending, your credit card usage, your luxury desire, your holidays, and to say, how does this pursue the kingdom? Does this decision express a single eye, a single heart, a single king? Does this decision allow me, encourage me to seek those who bear the image of God and are still his enemies? Is that how you ponder your spending? Is that how you discern your earning? Is that how you decide your saving? your investment, your luxury items, your economic and employment decisions. As I make this decision, does it enable me to seek the kingdom of God? Third, to call God Father and Jesus is Lord 
is to know this wonderful promise. Your Father knows what you need. Your Father knows what you need as you pursue his kingdom. Do you know that goodness of the removal of anxiety and worry because your Father knows what you need? Now, uh, let me finish with this confession. I struggle with that one. <laughs> God is my Father. I look out this morning and there are beautiful birds on my front lawn in that ice and they are not hungry. I look out at our garden and the kale is glorious, the flowers are colourful and they don't have anyone doing the sowing for them. My Father knows what I need. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you know what I need. I thank you that you know I need Jesus to live for me, to die for me, to rise for me. Father, thank you that you know I need righteousness, all of Jesus' righteousness, now given to us as we are connected to him. Father, thank you that you need, you know what I need as I live in your mob as a citizen of Jesus' kingdom, that you promise, you commit to provide all that I need to be one of your people. Father, Please claim us wholeheartedly. Please give us a single focus, a single heart. Father, please help us to live in the light of a single boss. Please help us to know your goodness in providing our daily needs. Father, please make that seep into and frame our economic decisions. Amen.